I've, I've been reading lately and thinking about, well, you know, in working with high school students, you just see the shifts in culture. I've been teaching high school students at Worldview Academy for 20 years, and you see sort of a decline in biblical literacy and, and a different approach to authority, and, and then the, the primacy of feelings. The first place we need to start is, okay, who, who are we? Uh, what does it mean to be a human person, and what is, what, how do we know what our purpose is? Welcome to Homeschool Talks, a podcast by HSLDA. This is a show about all things homeschooling, from practical tips to inspiring stories and everything in between. You can find show notes for this episode along with our other Homeschool Talks conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoy the program. Here's your host, Jim Mason. Hi, I'm Jim Mason, president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and this is another edition of Homeschool Talks. Today, we're uh, interviewing Mike Shutt from our National Leaders Conference in St. Louis, Missouri. Mike was one of our featured speakers. He's the executive director of the Worldview Academy. So welcome, Mike. Thanks, Jim. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. So Mike and I go way back. Uh, Mike, Mike doesn't uh, actually take blame for any of my subsequent career, but he was one of my early uh, law school professors way back when in Regent University. So Mike, you've had an exciting career. Tell us about it. Wow. So I started, uh, I am a lawyer by training. Uh, went to law school uh, back in the 80s at the University of Texas. And uh, when I was a law student, I thought things like, you know, this is really interesting, but gosh, it doesn't sound right. <laughs> you know, there's there's got to be another story to what criminal justice is. And I'm not sure the law is what they're saying it is. And so I just had sort of a, as a Christian in law school, I just had an experience where I was tr always trying to think, wait a minute, what are the unspoken presuppositions about what's going on here in law school? I went on to practice law in Fort Worth, Texas, and then uh, got an opportunity to teach at Regent Law School back about the time you got the call uh, to go go to go to law school. And and there, I think, by uh, through the grace of my colleagues and students like you and students, uh, I really had a great education in in really being. It was a blessing to be able to spend the time. You know, part of my job was to think Christianly about law, mm -hmm. think Christianly about what what God says about the human person and how it relates to justice issues. And so, so I had a, a career teaching uh, law, and then I I took a sabbatical uh, in the 2000, 2001 year where where we tried to take the Regent mission and uh, export it to Christian law students at other places, right? I had a heart for, man, I, I was at a, a great law school, but I didn't have any Christian mentors to help me think through this stuff. Wouldn't it be cool if I could do some of the things we're doing at Regent and do them at Stanford and Nebraska and Baylor and uh, and just help you know help students think. And so I went to work with the Christian Legal Society with a joint project with Regent Law School and Christian Legal Society. And to make a long story short, uh, began to work more and more closely with Christian Legal Society and working with their law student groups uh, around the country. And it was a Christian worldview and the law project. And uh, one day, uh, through some connections, I ran into a guy who had this operation called Worldview Academy. And uh, I went to a Worldview Academy uh, camp. It was a summer camp. There's summer intensives for 13 to 18 year olds. And this was on the, uh, on the campus of Baylor University. And I walk into this uh, auditorium of these you know, middle school and high school students. And there's a guy up front teaching barefoot and teaching about the behaviorism philosophy of B.F. Skinner. And there are, I don't know, 180, 200 students in this auditorium, and like half of them are raising their hands going, ooh, ooh, I want to talk. I want, you know, I want to interact on this. That's wrong. Or that, I, that's, uh, explain that to me. And I thought, man, this is an alternative universe. I'm in the <laughs> twilight zone where these kids want to argue and talk about B.F. Skinner. And so I was hooked. And so I gave a talk that day on law and government and justice and 
William Blackstone, <laughs> some other nerd stuff, and all these all these these students were eating it up, and I, I was hooked. And so, for the last twenty plus years, I've been teaching during the summers uh, with Christian Legal Society and Regent Law School, and later Trinity Law School, helping pay for my worldview habit to t- to teach high school students. And and I've always said the more I the more I deal with law students. Uh, the more I want to work with college students, the more I work with college students, the more I want to work with high school students because they're they're shaped by the time they get to law school. So, uh, and then a couple of years ago, uh, our executive uh, director stepped down, and there was a uh, a hole for an executive director. And be- because of what Worldview Academy had meant to my family and the blessing it was to me, I went ahead and took the job of executive director. And I've been doing that for two years. So that's maybe a little longer than you wanted, but that's the whole story. That's the I, didn't whole, le- I didn't leave anything That's out. the whole bio. The only thing you left out, I mean, really the only thing you left out is maybe the single most important part. Um, when you met me. Oh, yes. And you and yes, the, the, See, a seminal I, moment. I, I mean, the, how the could pivot you in my life was when as a young professor <laughs> meeting you and your family. I, it was great. I found out today that that Debbie, your wife, didn't even know that I was one of your professors. She, they just, she just thought, hey, we're, we go to church together, we're friends, and I, that's pretty awesome, actually. <laughs> yeah, so, so Regent University School of Law, I, I went to law school later in life than most, and, uh, and that, that's why Mike Shutt is my junior, yet my professor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, How did that I happen? Young, I was a young professor, that's right. you were an older and student. I was an old student. Yeah, that's right. And, we were. Um, and we both had kids. And so let's, this is this uh, podcast is called Homeschool Talks. Oh, so we met yes. in law school as you, my professor, and I, a student. But we really became acquainted through church, and eventually a home group, and we really connected because you and Lisa homeschooled your kids. Yes, yeah, we we did all the way all the way through. We have three children, and and uh, and started our oldest when he was in first grade. So yeah, yeah that's right. So that's that's really where we, and it is funny that my wife this morning she remembers all the good stuff, but not the bad stuff. Because I, I'm pretty sure you didn't give me a good grade. I, I don't oh, remember. I don't have. I don't a think good, you got any bad I don't, grades. I don't in have law a school. really good I know, memory I know I of it. I know I didn't. One of your one of your classmates, or maybe he was a couple years behind you. Uh, we were on the sort of the the welcome the welcome orientation mm. for new students mm-hmm. and he was with his wife he was an older student as well he was older than me and his wife we hadn't met he, she looked over at me and leaned over to her husband who was the law student and said see that guy over there he's never going to make it in law school <laughs> <laughs> to which well to, and, <laughs> to and which, look what happened yeah look what happened <laughs> to which his her husband said uh it's worse than you think he's my torch professor <laughs> so it was a great great moment So this Worldview Academy stuff, um, the talk you gave today here at the National Leaders Conference, um, there's probably a lot of of interest in our podcast audience for that topic. Can you give us an outline of the topic and tell us why it's so important? Sure. Uh, I was, uh, I've I've been reading lately and thinking about, well, you know, in working with high school students, you just see the shifts in culture. I've been teaching high school students at Worldview Academy for 20 years. And you see sort of a decline in biblical literacy and, and a different approach to authority. And, and then the, the primacy of what I talked about today, the primacy of feelings. Uh, and reading uh, Carl Truman's recent books, uh, one's called uh, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, and the other one, a more accessible, less academic, one that I can understand, is called Strange New World. Uh, Carl Truman's the author. He's a professor at Grove City. And he talks about the rise of expressive individualism, where uh, feelings and sort of internal, uh, the outward expression of internal feelings uh, are the key to the authentic self. And he traces it back philosophically. He talks about Descartes and um, uh, Freud and Marx and Rousseau and just how these philosophers have shaped the modern world. And even though most people haven't read those people and aren't influenced directly by their writings, uh, the air we breathe is is uh, infused with Nietzsche and Freud and and Marx and Rousseau in terms of the psycholo- psych- psychologizing of the self and this idea that who you are comes from within rather than from without. Not, not super surprising for those who, who believe there was no God and that re- religion was either a, a helpful prop or a, a harmful bane. Uh, and so, and, and so Truman talks about this, the, the modern world um, is, 
is trying to shape us uh, and does shape us in ways that we don't really recognize because we're swimming in this water. It's part of the wallpaper. It's the unspoken assumption uh, is that who we are are makers and shapers of the world. We're makers and shapers of ourselves and how we know how to shape comes from within when, within us. And, and I called that a threat to homeschooling, right? There are lots of external threats. Uh, so the Orwellian world we live in, the co-opting of language, the oppressive laws, all of that, those are threats too. But I, I thought we should start talking about the the the, the threat of, of the way we view ourselves and the way we view our world. And if it's not rooted in a created order that that we're 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 born to discover and we're born with certain gifts, talents, talents, gifts and talents uh, to be able to um, to discover what God has laid out for us and to be who he's called us to be. If it is not externally focused on our caller, uh, we are in, in the worst way, worldly, right? We are we are going along with the currents of the world. And and Truman's book makes the express connection between uh, the rise the rise of sort of the, the gender identity, so you know, so sexual orientation and gender identity movement and why the state is now authenticating uh, that, and then its implications for free speech and religious freedom. And so he does that in his book. I didn't talk a lot about that today because I think our first, the first place we need to start is, okay, who who are we? Uh, what does it mean to be a human person? And what is what? How do we know what our purpose is? So that's sort of the that's the 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 thesis of the of of where I was was headed in terms of a threat to homeschooling. So so the. The, the correct worldview or the, the, the created world, the worldview that we should have because we are created, um, how would you contrast that with the, the zeitgeist of today? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I used Ephesians 2.10. Uh, we are his workmanship. So we start with saying we're a masterpiece of God. We are created and we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. Uh, so he has tasks for us. He has um, he has purpose for us. Our purpose comes from him as our creator. Uh, and so the first thing is to recognize the you know, to world, use worldview language or theological language the the creature creator distinction, and we're creatures. And so to start with, oh, that that means I have obligations to someone other than myself. And then secondly, it says that he's created us in Christ Jesus for good works, which he's prepared beforehand for us to walk in them. And so we can understand our purpose uh, in light of how he's made us, and we can chase after him to see the works that he's called us to do, but also to walk among the other works that he's done, including other human beings, the created order, and to be able to discover uh, what he's laid out for us uh, is the, that's the task of the human person. And that's the worldview of, of the creature, uh, fully dependent on others, uh, made for community, but also made for, uh, for God. And made by him, so that would be the the first the first thing, and then the second is instead of giving validity to our wants and feelings to order those disordered desires, right? Original sin is well, it's a problem, and uh, and we we were talking to you and I were talking to Mike Smith after the talk, and he said the problem is we all we all know what's true, and then and then we don't do it, and we can't do it, and that's that's exactly right, and so so the the next step in that is to say okay. My desires can't be formed by what's inside of me. They have to have to be shaped and formed by my creator. How do I put myself in a place where I can be shaped and formed <laughs> for my desires to be directed in the right way instead of where I want them to go? Right. I, I know I know what the Bible says is true, but I, I don't, I can't or I won't uh, do it. And so the counterculture sh- the countercultural shaping, which I think is at the heart of home education. Habits, practices, knowledge, liturgies, as uh, Calvin University philosopher uh, Jamie Smith would say, countercultural liturgies in the church and in the home that push back against what the modern world is telling us, I think is part of the worldview that counters that. Well, you travel all over the country talking, uh, especially to high school age students. Um, do you have a lot of homeschoolers in those crowds? Uh, we do, we do. So, and we and we, the Worldview Academy faculty, we we like to do workshops and talks at homeschool conventions, and and I, I think a lot of uh, this is our twenty seventh summer, I think, 
I think. Mm. Uh, we were founded back in, in 1996 ish, uh, back in 1996. And so we've been doing this for a while. And it really started out as we were probably 80 to 85% homeschool students, right? Families who saw worldview training as significant. And again, we're not telling these students anything they're not hearing at home. In fact, it, it, I mean, it's a kick for me when a parent comes up and complains that their student comes home and says, dad, you'll never guess what I learned at Worldview Academy. And it's mm-hmm. like, I've been telling you that for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And it, it's it's wonderful because as parents, we know we need other voices to speak in into our students and to to train and to and help. So that's how we see ourselves as coming alongside families. And homeschool families, I think, were the first to recognize what Worldview Academy could do in terms of being a tool. I had a mom here come up to me and say, the tuition for Worldview Academy is the best money we ever spent on our students. And of course, you love to hear that. But she said, our, our kids our kids come home transformed. And it's interesting that it is out of proportion to what to what we do, right? You, you do camp, you give some talks, you, you, you encourage students, but it's the combination of the discipleship aspect. They're in groups of students, their same age and sex with a college student who is helping them unpack the lectures, but also just talk about life. And to be able to go in in this modern world where the current is against what they're learning at home and to go to a camp where there's a hundred students who really want to dig into questions about you know the worldview of law and justice, the epist- Christian epistemology, moral anthropology, they look around and they're like, oh, it's I'm I'm not alone. It's not just me. There are there are other really bright, interesting humans that I can talk about this stuff with. And so that's the encouragement of peers, but it's also the reinforcement of what they're already learning. And then just the environment of being able to spend a week disconnected from your from your phone, uh, from the activities that are pressing in in on you. And so uh, we do talk to a lot of homes, homeschool students. I think our our demographic is still a majority majority homes homeschool students, uh, just because they're the kinds of families, I think, who see the most need uh, and appreciate the most what a a supplemental week of this uh, intensive training can do. You used an interesting word. Um, You you said we're counter-cultural. I grew up at a time when counter-culture meant you were a hippie. So what do you mean by (laughs) counter-cultural? Yeah, that's a great question because Rousseau uh, thought uh, being an expressive individual was countercultural, right? And that the society, the herd mentality was what culture was, and that would ruin your authentic self. And so I mean the opposite of countercultural to what Rousseau meant. Uh, and so so it is a great question. It means different things at different different times. And I think the uh, maybe what I mean is countermodern, uh, that that we we are we are in a world um, that gives primacy to feelings. We're in a world uh, that has a definition of the human person and law that are that are at odds with what we know to be true. Uh, that knowledge comes from uh, something else. There's a scien- scientistic streak in the culture that that uh, that blurs subjective and objective truth and and all the rest. And so what I mean by countercultural is is being in a place uh, where you're not just going along with the stream of the of, of modernity or the stream of what everyone else is doing, um, but it's it's to be un, unworldly, right? In Romans 12, 1 and 2, um, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so to me, countercultural is resisting the pattern of the world around us, whatever its current manifestations, right? It's all fine and good to talk about, oh, modernity and uh, individual, uh, expressive individualism and all of that as today's problem, but it's always been a problem. There, there, there's all, the world is always pushing in on us, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, you know, the, the emperor is, is God uh, and we have to be countercultural and saying Jesus is Lord. Uh, that's not the problem we have. Well, maybe it is the problem we have today. But anyway, that's another topic. So whatever the what whatever the 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 world, uh, the pattern of the world that is pressing in on us to be countercultural to say no, I'm I'm going to think like Jesus. Uh, I'm 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 going to uh, chase after my Creator and to uh, to counter the pressing in of the world by being transformed by the renewing of my mind and by presenting my body as a living sacrifice with my habits. and, mm. and- 
So you can help me out here, and, and uh, this will go a little bit farther afield, but what in the world is postmodernism? Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's a great question. And there's so many people that w really are great on this question. Um, uh, Gene Edward Veith's book, Postmodern Times, was influential in me in thinking about it. Uh, and, a lot of, and, and, uh, and, and there's another, another book by Jamie. I've mentioned Jamie Smith already in his book, um, You Are What You Love, where he talks about the, the countercultural liturgies. He wrote another book called Who's Afraid of Postmodernism? I think is the name of it, uh, and and this it, it's a it's a it's a good companion to the Vith book, but but it's a so postmodernism is really just more modernism. <laughs> it's it's after modern. It's after modernism, and and only in the sense that that the the I think that the relativism and the uh, the the expressive individualism even uh, that we've talked about is more pronounced in terms of morality itself is untethered. Uh, I think in the modern world, there was a, um, maybe a, a hostility to religion because it was oppressive in its, uh, you know, in its rules and, and regulations. Postmodernism is more like, ah, religion, it's all good. Believe what you want to believe. Uh, rules, they're all, they all come out of what's inside of us, man. Uh, so so, uh, so the, po the postmodern world, I think, the, the earmarks of postmodernism is, is this, this idea that the world is plastic uh, or Plato and that we can not Plato as in the Republic, but Play-Doh, uh, uh, it's plastic and shapeable and we can make what, what we want it to make. We, we, wanna, we can make it how we want to make it and we can make ourselves who we want to be. I think th those are earmarks of postmodernism that were not quite as present in, the, in, in modernity. So one of the thoughts that I've, I, I've had uh, a lot lately is, you know, as a Christian, we're freed from our sin and God is transforming us from our sinful being into his image. What are we freed to though? We're freed from something. What are we freed to? Um, any thoughts on that? Ooh. Yeah. I, I, the thing that comes to mind when I'm thinking about education and, and a lot of this is because I've been digging into the Truman and then thinking about, okay, so here I am at this, this convention. How, what does this have to do with education? You know, how is this helpful to education? I think one of the things is one of the things that we're freed to is delight and flourishing in the created world, even though it's fallen. We're freed to hope, uh, uh, the hopefulness of the plan of redemption, and we're freed to also to push and to work in the kingdom that is at hand. And so, so to be able to look at, we're, we're freed, we're freed from sin. Uh, and so, and we look around us and say, well, mm, corruption's all around us. I even see it in my heart still. So how am I free? Well, uh, we're putting on the new self daily, putting, putting off the old man and putting on the new one. And so we're, we're free not to sin. So that's a freedom. And then that freedom not to sin gives us the ability then to push the things that we have our hands on more and more under the kingship and the lordship of Jesus. So whether that be our families, we're, we're free to say, I'm resisting uh, the devil. I'm resisting my flesh by pushing the way I do family, the way I do, the way I'm a dad, uh, the way I'm a friend. Uh, I'm, I'm actually free to do that in a way that uh, is, a, is as a servant of the, of the true king. And so I'm doing kingdom work in my home and in my, with my hands as a lawyer or a doc or a mechanic, right? I'm, I'm free actually to do my work to the glory of God and to do ordinary work that helps other people flourish and look at that work as oh, something that you know, gives me delight in the, in the world. Uh, it, it enters into uh, my, my creatureliness as something God's given me. That if I'm good with my hands, I'm not, but if I were, uh, I could de delight in that and and then to see others flourish through that and have delight in my creator in it. So I think we're we're free to work in the world in a way that uh, serves others and and loves God. So a word that might describe all that that isn't talked about or mentioned very much in this plastic, you know, do what makes you feel good world is virtue. Hmm. What what is virtue? <laughs> Wow, you got hard, you got have hard questions. Well, I got like twenty <laughs> minutes to fill here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, but this is fascinating I stuff. It. I love it this is, is this is where this you know as the the older I get, 
And the longer I pursue these things, the more things kind of really boil down to just the essentials. You know, there's, there's, there's some fundamentals here. And the world today is, is not, it's not saying you're freed from sin and sinfulness and you're free to pursue virtue. Um, that's, you know, th- that's not what it's telling us. So what does it mean to be able to do that? Yeah. Wh- wh- why is that so important? Is there such a thing as truth? You know, that these are questions that, uh, you know, they, they're, they're ever present. And there's a, there's a kind of a ongoing raging debate. And it seems like in a little bit of a way, our side's losing here. <laughs> what is virtue? <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, so I guess, I guess there are there are a couple there are there are various answers to that 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 question, um, and I, the way I think about it, and this this may not be a a classic a way to think about it at all, is is um, is is the root and foundation of all ethics. First of all, so how what is what is it? What character traits do I have that who who I am driving what I do? Um, so I think virtue. Uh, is a question of the right being, right? Uh, so uh, love and charity are virtues. So that means that I'm a person uh, or I have a, the, the virtuous trait of seeing others as, as, as those who are to be served rather than those who are to be used for my, for my end for my own ends. Um, if I have the virtue of hospitality, it sees, it sees that my, my, my goal is to, uh, I, I see, I guess the world it's, I guess it's more, uh, of the being of, of who I am, the character side of these virtues is w- what is, what is in me, what is being formed in me, uh, that helps me live in a way that is others, uh, other centered, that other centered, uh, the the virtue of, of courage says there are there are things that are more more important uh, than than what I'm afraid of. Uh, there are things that are more important in this situation. There's a uh, there's a there's a greater um, maybe it's an end. Yeah, maybe virtue is is seeing our end as as human beings in a in a more precise way. You, do you have an you have an answer for that? What well, so what would so you say virtue is? It would seem to me that what we've lost sight of is that um, you know, as a culture, as a society, that we are freed to um, you know, human flourishing is not defined by what makes me feel good. Human flourishing is defined by conforming our 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 inner selves and our outward actions to the correct uh, created order. And by doing that, we learn virtue, and by leading virtuous lives, we flourish. Yeah. And virtuous lives don't always mean successful in the world's eyes. It can mean sacrificial. You know, courage doesn't mean I'm not afraid. Courage means I do things that I'm afraid of because they're right. Mm-hmm. And so seeking virtue, you know, trying to become virtuous is an end that, I mean, we don't talk about it a lot. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I don't know if that's a very good that's answer good. either. I think but, that's a good answer. I think uh, that is a, that is a good answer, um, and it may be part of uh, uh, part of the um, discussion of why why we're not great at countering expressive individualism in our culture is that we don't talk enough about. Um, well, you talked about it. Success in in that doesn't mean living through it. Uh, it doesn't mean not being hurt. It doesn't mean not dying. It doesn't. It, it means being faithful. And so we we don't think a lot about faithfulness. If we go to church to feel great about ourselves uh, and others, uh, and, and there is a sense in, in in which that should be part of what happens. But if that's the only end, and we're only singing. We're only singing inspirational tunes and things that make us feel good. And we're only talking about things that are happy. And we're not talking about suffering. We're not talking about martyrdom. Or we're not talking about the martyrs. We're not talking about history. We're not talking about failure. Um, then we're not, you know, we're not countering expressive individualism at all. We're, 
we're we're falling into it. So I mean that's a that's a great I think it's a great point. So I I, I want to go a little bit south here um, to Texas. Yeah, we're going to head to Texas now. Okay. And uh, during the talk today, uh, you 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 introduced a brand new philosophy that I think is going to sweep the country actually, and it's called. Buy me a boatism, right? <laughs> did I get that right? You buy did. me a boatism. Buy me a boatism. What yeah. is buy me a boatism? <laughs> yeah. So, so I, so Chris Jansen, country singer, has a great song called "Buy Me a Boat," uh, and he says, uh, "I ain't rich, but I want to be." Uh, I wish I had a rich uncle had kicked the bucket, and I was sitting on a pile like Warren Buffett. Right? He wants to be. He wants to be wealthy. Uh, and uh, and in the song, he says, I keep hearing that money is the root of all evil and you can't fit a camel through the eye of a needle, uh, which is his attempt at quoting scripture. Pretty great. Uh, and then he says, I'm sure that's all probably true, but it still sounds pretty cool to be rich. And so when I heard that song the first time, first time I ever heard it was live at the Grand Ole Opry. I didn't I'm not a big country music guy, but uh, I did. I thought the song was hilarious uh, because he says money can't buy me happiness, but it can buy me a boat. And that's all, that's all I need. And so he wants to be rich. And he says, look, the Bible may say there are dangers in being rich, but eh, I still want to do it. And I thought, oh, that's how I do with scripture. That's how we read scripture is, oh, and I, it sounds right. I'm sure it's right. It's, it's the Bible. Heck, it's got to be right. Um, but I don't really want to order my life around it. So that's buy me a boatism. I know, I know that scripture is probably true, but I don't have the courage, maybe, or the virtue, uh, or the wherewithal, or the habits, or the training, or the tools to order my life around it. And I think that's, uh, pardon the pun, the boat that we're in is uh, is is we even if we know what scripture says, and that and that's more debatable these days, right? I think one of the challenges uh, for uh, home educators is to train their students in in knowledge, uh, knowledge not just of scripture as a devotional, inspirational book, but knowledge of systematic theology, knowledge of biblical theology, the story arc of redemption in the scripture, what it means to have a quiet time daily, and what what that's about. And so to to say, I, I am familiar <laughs> with God's word. I do believe it is it is God's revelation of Himself, and therefore it is central to who I am and what I do, informing of virtue, informing of character in how I live, forming my ethical uh, outlook. Uh, we've got to we've got to teach that they they have to understand the real centrality of Scripture. We all say that the Bible is the rule and standard for our life, but we don't all actually know what it says. So that's the first step, and then the next step is. How are we forming and shaping one another um, to be able to cooperate with God's grace in being able to do it? Because as Mike Smith was telling us this morning, he goes, we, we all know it's true. The, the, the trick is doing it. And so, um, so to me, not just the teaching of the scripture, but the shaping, and this goes back to countercultural liturgies, to habits. Um, how, are we, how are we cooperating with God's grace? Uh, is it a sin not to fast? Well, no. Uh, nor is it a sin to have a fast and then to break it. But on the other hand, if we're not fasting, um, then we're probably not putting ourselves in the sorts of positions that um, denying your desire for food will help you uh, form in your life, right? So if I, I think Dallas Willard is the one who says the uh, spiritual disciplines are things that help you do indirectly what you can't do by direct effort. And so the spiritual disciplines that we're teaching our children even like fasting, prayer, Bible study, these are things, you don't get brownie points for fasting. That's just not eating. Is that spiritual? No, but it's a practice uh, that helps you deny yourself when you're hungry. And so you're telling yourself, oh, what I feel inwardly, hunger is not something that needs to immediately be gratified. I think the same can be said about passing the plate at church. I think online giving uh, is, is, um, is too cultural. I think it's countercultural now to you have to take out your wallet or your checkbook and you have to physically put money in the plate. And that's saying, the stuff I have in my wallet, the stuff I have in my checkbook, the stuff I have in my account, that's not mine. And I'm doing an act that says, God, I know it's all yours, but this is just an <laughs> this is just a practice uh, that's just telling you and telling me that all the stuff I have is actually is actually yours. And so we can teach disciplines like that. I think the I think the key to 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 counter buy me a boatism is 
um, knowledge of Scripture, immersion in Scripture, reading it the right way and having having right knowledge, but also then the right practices that help shape and cooperate with being able to live it out. So two things you just said reminded me of something from my own personal life. And because it's my podcast, I can say this. I can talk about it. So, you know, the pandemic changed church. Uh, for a lot of people for for a period of time and we my church went to kind of Facebook church for a little bit and and so online giving became a thing and I you know I set up an online giving thing and, and then when we started back in, in in you know attending church I just left it go because yeah well it's pretty you know I mean I'm doing it <laughs> yeah and then it, it occurred to me just exactly what you said that the the passing of the plate and the act of putting something in it. I mean, I'm not saying that there's any you know divine purpose yeah. in passing no, no. a plate or anything like that. Agre- but agree. But there is an act. You know, we as as um, created beings often you know we we must act in ways that reflect the inner things that are going on. And so totally right. So we uh, I I started. Uh, I didn't stop my online stuff, but I started also writing a check just so that I could make that act Super as the cool. plate was. So That's then, cool. yeah, I mean, so, you know, who knew? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the other thing, you said a little bit about this during your talk today. Um, my daughter, who just uh, went off to Grove City College, maybe she'll meet Carl Truman. Sweet. Um, a couple, three years ago, we realized that when we were in church, we had our, you know, handheld supercomputer always at the ready and my kids i my kids are much smarter than i am they uh, they stopped social media way before i realized how bad it was even but but so my daughter and i made a pinky promise that when we went to church we would both leave our phones in the car and you know it it sort of i kind of fought that because I've got like my Gideon Bible app yeah. on the phone, you know, so I could I could read along with the Bible and all that. But it it's it's sort of a wow, we have become so tied in to what happens on this supercomputer we carry in our pockets. And that has more cultural implications and more worldview implications than we have time to go into right now. Yeah. But um there's 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 a lot of things that modernity have brought that have been blessings but they've also kind of been curses yeah yeah totally right i think the social internet supercomputer in your pocket is the big is the big threat right now and a lot of people are writing about it there's a lot of great things on it uh if the listeners haven't read terms of service by chris martin or 12 12 ways your phone is changing you i mean those books are really helpful in saying this this stuff it it, it matters. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, waking waking up having an alarm on your phone rather than a, a separate alarm brings you to your phone first thing in the morning. Even little things like that. There's just so much. You're right. The worldview implications. And I said today that I think that the number one threat. And I quoted uh, Neil Postman from his uh, 1985 book uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, where he said it's it's not it's not. Um, it's not the danger, the, the external oppression that's really the danger. The danger is our own loves. And, I, and of course, that's a little bit of what I was talking about. But, but he says, that his line is, we will come to, to adore the technologies that undo our capacities to think. And we really have. I mean, that was, he wrote that before the internet, before smartphones, before email was ubiquitous. He, he knew that, that, that technology, the advancement of human beings, we we're going to love our own progress. We're going to love our own advancement. And even though he couldn't see s- smartphones exactly, he saw television. <laughs> that was enough to say this is this is changing how we think about the world. The the way we process information is central to who we are and to how we think. And smartphones change the way the way we interact with the world. Mm-hmm. It, just, it just does. Well, Mike, I, I'm so glad we could catch up. Uh, we ran into each other a few months ago at a conference, and I grabbed you up for, for this conference. I'm glad you could make it. Tell people how they can find out more about your work at Worldview Academy. Thanks, and, and thanks a million for having me on the podcast, but also here at the conference. It's been a, it's been a huge blessing. So and it's also been a blessing to reconnect with you and, and your family, too. Uh, Worldview Academy, worldview.org uh, is our website. Uh, we do camps uh, all over the country. 
Uh, so there are, there are camps are regional, uh, regional camps, summer intensives to, to make it easier for younger students uh, to come. You don't have to fly across the country. There's one within uh, shouting distance uh, of you. Uh, and so we, we also come to churches and do weekend uh, conferences as well. Uh, and those are more information there is about those are available on worldview.org uh, as well. But weekend conferences are, are, it's not just a way to, to tell people about us. It's a way to, to, to minister to churches who come together in an area and, uh, and bring other churches and pastors together uh, with their students to be able to together to have sort of a family time of, of engagement on these topics. And we also have monthly Zoom conversations uh, for families uh, on different topics. We had one uh, just last week on, uh, uh, yeah, last week? No, this week. We had one this week uh, that the recording will be up soon on C.S. Lewis and transposition and how that, what that tells us about teaching and learning uh, in community. So the website is worldview.org and um, we'd love to connect with uh, listeners. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, being here at our conference. And uh, a reminder, uh, I'm Jim Mason, president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and you can find out more about our work and what we do at hslda.org. O-R-G, that's H-S-L-D-A for Homeschool Legal Defense Association dot O-R-G. Thanks for listening today and uh, tune in next time. Today's program is made possible by HSLDA's team of educational consultants. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the number of curriculum options to choose from? Or maybe you're frustrated because your child is struggling and you're not sure what to do next. Our educational consultants can help. As an HSLDA member, you have access to customized, practical guidance on everything from lesson planning and record keeping to helping a child with learning difficulties. If you want to experience less frustration and more progress in your home school, get support from our educational consultants by becoming a member of HSLDA. Learn more at hslda.org forward slash join. That's hslda.org forward slash join. Thanks for listening to this episode of Homeschool Talks. If you've enjoyed this conversation, will you do us a favor by sharing it with a friend or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts? As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode along with our other Homeschool Talks conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, you can sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. That's all for now. We hope you enjoyed this program and we'll see you next time.